I am Cindy Perkins. I get to serve as the executive director for the Bonhoeffer Project. And it is my privilege today and my honor to be able to talk with Bill Hull, uh, who is discipleship guru for, I don't know, 40 plus years, maybe longer. Um, Not longer, please. And he's written a lot of books, and he's probably forgotten more than I'll ever know about discipleship. And I'm excited because today we're going to talk about his latest book. He has uh, just finished or is just finishing putting the final touches on a book called No Longer a Bystander. And um, I think in, in our culture and our society right now, it's a really important topic for us to talk about. How do we get people in the conversation. So I'm just going to ask Bill a couple of questions and we're just going to have a conversation. And we're so glad that you have joined us today to be a part of this. So Bill, let me ask you the, the first question I want to know is what prompted you to write this latest book, No Longer a Bystander? Well, hello, Cindy. It's great to see you today and uh, to talk to those people who may have an interest in our subject. Uh, no longer a bystander, which essentially implies that I've been standing by. And I think really what motivated me to write the book was that in 2020, I was writing a series of articles. And one of the things that really struck me about it was how I got out of my lane into a new lane. I got out of the clerical lane, the spiritual realm, or just the disciple-making realm, and how that seemed so shut off from what was really happening every day in everybody's life. And how we had a, in 2020, sort of a perfect storm. And that perfect storm was... First, we had a global pandemic. Secondly, we had a national quarantine. We all learned to stay at home and wear a face mask. And who knows, we were told to wear them indoors, <laughs> even when you're just sitting there with your family. Uh, three, we, we had a self-imposed shutdown of our economy. That had really never happened before, where we just shut it down. Uh, fourthly, we had a presidential election, which exacerbated everything, which politicized our lives more than we want it to have politicized. Uh, number five, we had an attack on the U.S. Capitol that was, for the first time, I think that we saw people storming into the Capitol, and that was disturbing to most Americans. And then we had months of riots and looting in the streets and burning of buildings and people uh, getting away with it, which was really, really disturbing, uh, that law and order had seemed to gone out the window. And so with all of that, this is the perfect storm. And you say, well, what in the world does Bible study and prayer and singing songs about God have to do with all this? I mean, after all, can we stop this madness? Can we somehow change it up? Uh, what can we do? You know, this disciple-making movement just seems so separate from that and irrelevant from that. And, you know, really is that, it seems like we've been doing that for 50 years and look what's happened. We have chaos. And so it was with that in mind, with that, I guess, disturbed spirit and uh, wanting to speak out because Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and of course we work in the Bonhoeffer Project, and he said this, and one of the interesting things is when you, everybody in Christendom who knows anything about Diedrich Bonhoeffer has heard this quote, silence in the face of evil is itself evil, and God will not hold us guiltless, guiltless is the word, not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. All right. Do you know there's a lot of controversy of whether or not Diedrich Bonhoeffer actually said that? And there is not, it's not in any of his works, but there are a few 
uh, clues as to when it was said and why it was said. And so I do believe it's authentic because it's consistent with everything else. But it was that idea that uh, I couldn't just, you know, the cover of the book has me leaning against my car with a Bonhoeffer license plate on the front of it. And I'm just standing there as a bystander. And I say, no, I'm going to get out of my lane now. I'm going out of the clerical lane into the cultural lane into uh, some weaving in and out of the political lane a little bit. And just trying to speak out and stand up and not shut up, hmm. even though I may get canceled. I think it I'd celebrate if I got thrown off Twitter as a result of this book. I would just love it because, hey, somebody's paying attention. Hmm. Okay, so that's why I did it. So, so stepping into the cultural lane right now, and you, you mentioned cancel culture, so that is, is a big deal to a lot of people. Um, but I know that over the course of this year of writing these columns, you've gotten some pushback, right? And mm -hmm. so how do you deal with, because all of us, when we decide to take a stand, uh, when we decide to no longer be a bystander, we're going to get some pushback. So, so what do you do? How do you deal with the pushback that comes from within our tribe and from without in cancel mm -hmm. culture? Because mm -hmm. the pushback comes both places, right? Yeah, I do believe that Christianity is plagued with this idea that we should just overwhelm the world with being nice. Mm. And I don't think nice is that big of a premium if you just look at the life of Jesus. Uh, Jesus wasn't out to be nice. He was out to be good. Yeah. And sometimes goodness has something to do with toughness. Now, Jesus didn't go looking for a fight. But when he found one, and we would all agree that he found one, he didn't back up. And I think that's the spirit. That's the Christian spirit. That's the Christ spirit. So uh, there are some in the body of Christ, and I'm sure they're, they're well-meaning, who think that really the best thing for us to do is just fold our hands in prayer and just take it. Now, there's a couple of levels on which we are fighting. One is you can fight in the political realm and by voting and good citizens, we should do all that kind of thing. But then a lot of the church in the world is not living in a democracy. They don't vote or they do vote. It's uh, not a fair vote. And so in our culture, we happen to have this thing called democracy or republic or representative republic. And there is ways in which we can influence and move the, the moral framework back and forth to and fro through our activity. And so I think as Christians, as salt and light, there, you know, we're salt and light in our life, but we also can be salt, a preservative for culture and light and illumination to culture in the moral darkness and confusion by speaking up. And those, not everybody can speak up. I mean, some people have the ability to read and write in ways that are convincing. Some people uh, have positions of power. And as Christians, we authentically and with integrity speak up. I think that that's all part of it. Uh, I'm not sure that that answers your question. It's a, it's a it's a start of an answer, but I'm going to probe a little deeper. So okay. So why or when do you think God's people became bystanders in this world? Because I think by and large, um, we as God's people are hesitant uh, or maybe even negligent to be in this world, but not of it. Right. So there's that. There's that paradox that says how do i how am i to be in the world but not of it how am i to speak out without being unkind right because sometimes it'll feel unkind to those who don't agree with us so why or when do you think god's people landed in that place well i think in america anyway yeah it has something to do with separation of church and state and that we always felt the government protects us and then we support the government. Mm -hmm. And that we stay in our lane. That 
it's against the law, apparently, for clergy to endorse or church to endorse a political candidate during election season. That's not followed uh, in many places, but a lot of us have followed it. And we've gotten accustomed to law and order in the court system and the electorate to be able to control the situation and keep life quiet and meaningful for most people who call themselves Christian. But what's changed is that now that seems to be evaporating, uh, where there is not order any longer, but chaos. So for example, just a typical example, I, I don't own a gun, but there are people in my neighborhood who have not owned guns before who have now purchased them and have gone out and taken training. Now, why is that? The reason is, is that it seemed like the police would always show up and the courts would prosecute and that they would take care of crime. But now some of my neighbors don't feel like that. They feel threatened. They don't think they can count anymore on that kind of thing. And that's just one example of how when society begins to crumble around you, that you begin to lose confidence in its institutions. And then you think, well, I have to do something. And I think it's this anxiety that has caused a lot of people who are Christian, who aren't accustomed to being in this arena, to actually step into that arena and we do so, we do so clumsily. Uh, we do without much experience. And so we spout off and we say things and we have to take them back. And, and of course, everybody's doing that in our society right now. And sometimes we're getting canceled and uh, some people aren't that sophisticated at explaining uh, their viewpoint. So I think that what caused it is that, the anxiety and the chaos, what is but I do believe that, that what we've been taught is to partition off our spiritual, spirituality and not to be activist. And uh, I'm not a natural activist, uh, especially I've not really been in the political realm. I've not, um, I've not been a person who marches and, and leads uh, crusades or any kind, but... Uh, Martin Luther said, if you want to change the world, pick up a pen and write. And that's one thing I can do. And, and I, I think that uh, one other thing about this, uh, Leslie Newbegin was a missionary statesman. And he, he wrote a couple of books in 1988, 89. One was called Foolishness to the Greeks. Another one was called, uh, I have it right here, uh, The uh, Gospel in a Pluralistic Society. And, and a lot of the things he said were very prophetic. And he talked about a missionary encounter and the church establishing a missionary encounter in our culture. And he was talking about Western culture, the former what we call Western civilization. And what he was saying is that a missionary encounter is, first of all, that we confront the culture with the truth. And that truth is what does the word of God say? And so we believe in the word of God. And if we believe in the word of God, what's going to happen is you don't have to go looking for the fight. You don't have to go look for conflict. You don't have to wander around your neighborhood and find somebody you disagree with. Because all you really need to do is just believe and practice and talk as though the Bible is true. And if you do, you'll have conflict. But without that conflict, you won't have converts. And that's one of the things Newbigin says, that converts come out of that conflict where truth collides with the, the, the biblical narrative, collides with the historical or present day contemporary narrative. Well, and I think we see that happening all around us even more. I know sometimes I'm left scratching my head like, where did you get that idea? It is so contrary to anything that makes any kind of sense. And so... 
So in a way we, as we're being salt and light, we're, we're almost forced into the role of a, of a quiet activist, right? In mm -hmm. that place, yeah. if we're, if we're going to stand for truth in that place. So, so it, here's my next question. What can we do? How can we help those around us uh, learn how to enter the conversation appropriately, right? Like I, I don't ever post on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. I watch it. Sometimes I shake my head, but I don't ever post because I know that that's the place where people are just going to get in an uproar if you say mm -hmm. just the wrong thing. And if you're not articulate, which a lot of people aren't, right, then you're not going to be able to say it in a way that's not going to be offensive because you're not thinking about all the many facets that we have in the world. So how do we help our fellow believers to get in the game, to have those conversations and learn how to have those conversations with the basis of love, not fear. Because I think when we get ugly, it's because we're fearful, right? And so how yeah. do we teach them how to do that? Well, it does go back to some of the real basics. Uh, and what I mean by that is, first of all, just knowing and meditating and thinking through the scriptures. And, and there's no substitute for that. So daily reading uh, or regular reading of scripture and discussing the scriptures and how they relate to social concerns that we have with uh, other Christian people so that we can develop our mess message. We can develop our response. And so you know, we talk about Christian apologetics, and we study the, the books about apologetics as res with respect to some of the major questions that have been asked since humankind has been around, like, what about people who have not heard the gospel, or what, what's the source of evil, you know, there, all these things about how do you know that the New Testament is, is documents are reliable, these are all standard ways in which you study apologetics, but there's also this other set of apologetics. For example, uh, how do you talk about marriage or the family or human sexuality or standards for what is there a, a standard moral objective foundation for Western civilization and why should we follow it? Uh, those kinds of things are all part of the discussion. So I think the church is for discipleship, and part of our discipleship is, is being able to interact, I mean, uh, and, and, and to be able to engage the culture uh, with, in conversation. So I think it's part of the training, just like we train people to have their elevator gospel or be able to tell somebody what the essence of the gospel is. We should be able to have some basic answers, some no in scripture where it says that, let's say, why are we pro-life? Well, we're pro-life because of this, because of these passages, because of this history of the church. So I think that's part of it. Uh, another part of it that's really important is living in community and uh, growing into Christ-likeness so that when we engage the world, that we have the qualities of our life are likened to that of Jesus so that, that there's some authenticity in what we say. So it's the way we say it and the attitude in which we say it. And this is where I think we get into trouble. We get passionate, we get strong, and we start yelling or uh, some of our representatives, and I don't mean officially, but I mean people representing Christ or the church, especially those who are in the public view, uh, you know, can exacerbate things by, you know, wanting to get clicks or wanting to get likes or wanting to raise money or, and they have an alternative, an alternative motive. And uh, I think that that's all the dangers, but I think it starts with our own personal discipleship because the church is for discipleship, but disciples are God's gift to the world. So we can love the world as Christ loved and then this is what my book is about, is talking about, look at the diagnosis of this problem. What are some of the correctives that we can take? What are the ways we can apply it? And uh, all of these things 
as the, the cover of the book says, I think a radical way to understand our spirituality and how it affects our culture and the world in which we live. And I think all of us want to know that our children and our grandchildren are going to have a good shot at a good life. And that we, from a biblical point of view, uh, don't want us to go into a dystopian kind of culture. Right. And so you talked a little bit about uh, motivation and about discipleship. How do we as disciplers uh, help people figure out what their motivations are? Because you're right. Some people, uh, they have for their motivation, let me get some more clicks or let me be famous in that place. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and so I wonder sometimes, how do we help them to find the right motivation for what they want to say? Does that make sense? Is that a... Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think a person, uh, to have the right motivation, needs to be in uh, concert with God. Uh, I mean, to, to see the world as Jesus saw it. And the only way you can do that is spending time with God's word, understand and spending time with God's people uh, and and coming to understand the world that you live in as well. So reading about the world, reading about you know, having good conversations with people that you can have conversations with and why they differ than, from you. So you begin to understand other people's viewpoints. And that way you can enter into conversation with a person without being defensive, without being angry, and without hollering at them and or stomping off and uh, or condemning them for having a different viewpoint. Because a person who it doesn't believe in God, well, if you take it from their viewpoint, uh, they can believe almost anything and it would make sense to them, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I would think so. Where we look at in, in this, time and society, both both in the U.S. and across the world, there's a, there's a big outcry for justice. And I think about the difference, and, and I've done a little bit of study, um, I want to do more study on the difference between social justice and biblical justice. Mm -hmm. how, how do you see discipleship helping to formulate our thought process on where that goes? Um, like, should we be involved in, as Christians, in uh, stepping into the realm of social justice? Um, is well, this is a very, you know, this can become complex. But I, I, I believe that anytime you put an adjective in front of the word justice, mm. it's probably the wrong thing to do. Uh, so social justice has come to mean ways in which we can re-engineer society to right wrongs that have to do with discrimination and whether it be sexual discrimination, racial discrimination, economic discrimination. And so you take and you try to fix all of that through some sort of reparations. And I'm not speaking specifically about reparations for slavery, uh, even though that, that's part of the discussion. It's, I'm talking about trying to repair damage that's been done. Okay, so there's been lots of efforts to repair the damage that's been done. But I think that whenever we say, now that's, that's what the Christian message is, then I think that's wrong because the Christian message is about repairing what's gone wrong, but repairing what's gone wrong is so much more fundamental and deeper than simply uh, social justice. It has to do with sin itself. It has to do with uh, the destruction to the human personality. It has to do with all these issues of alienation and sinfulness. And, uh, and it has to do with all those bedrock things about the human being. And that's what the Bible's talking about. I think also... Um, by reading scripture and by knowing it, you have an ability to sort out what's good and bad. You, you have, 
it, you know, you say, well, it's it's just, you know, it's more just to put a person, uh, to let a person out of prison than to put them in. Uh, yeah, okay. It, if depends on the situation, but not in general. I, I don't think you can make a generalization about that. And uh, it's like the canard that there are more black men in prison than there are in college is simply not true. It's not a fact. It's, it's wrong. It's a fact. Uh, but it doesn't keep people from using it. So I, I think that um, there is two systems of thought. You know, Reinhold Niebuhr was a liberal theologian who was at odds with Diedrich Bonhoeffer back in the 1930s. And Niebuhr was a a pastor in Detroit for like 14 years, and he was a great orator. Uh, he didn't have an earned doctorate. He went to Union Theological Seminary, and he was there, uh, became a star. He was on the front of Time magazine. He was, uh, people loved him. He was the darling of the left because he was uh, criticizing Billy Graham when Billy Graham in the 19, late 50s was doing his Madison Square Garden crusades in New York City. But Niebuhr talked about how societal sin is worse than personal sin. Now, there is such a thing as societal sin. Today, we talk about it as systemic problems. Okay, there are systemic problems in the culture. Yes, there are. But at the same time, the root of all that is still personal. And what the Bible is talking about is we start with the personal, and we get that straightened out, and then we can go to the cultural and the societal. Now that's, uh, I guess, again, it's a, it's a complex, uh, those are a few of my thoughts about it, but that it's a complex kind of discussion. It is a complex discussion. And, and what you say that we start with the individual sin and move out the societal sin. Um, so yeah, it's like this argument, you know, people used to say, I remember uh, James Davison Hunter, who is a sociologist at the University of Virginia, uh, I've spoken uh, with regard to his writing a few times, and he said that essentially that societal problems uh, are not going to be solved by individual spirituality. He thinks that they have to be done by the leaders of the culture and so on, because like the, the president of Harvard, when he says something, has a lot more power than, let's say, the publisher of the Moline Dispatch. So yeah, that that's probably true as an observation, but it's sort of like, is Rick Warren famous today? Uh, does he have, Rick Warren have a lot of fame, uh, a lot of power today in the, in the society and in church because he's Rick Warren or because he's a pastor of a really large church, Saddleback Church? Okay, uh, the answer is that he has a lot of influence because he's a pastor of this huge church and he's been there for a long time and he's made a big impact in the world. But... The reason that Rick Warren is that way is not because Rick Warren at one time, I knew him when he was just a guy with horn rimmed glasses and he had no church. And so he, he actually was attending, he attended my church a couple of times, but he, nobody knew who he was at that time. Okay, but he was still the fundamental guy, the person, the, 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 the characteristics that he had, the spirit he had, the, the spiritual life that he had is what made him what he is now. And that's what my point was, that Hunter's observations are true as a social scientist. But essentially, the thing that changes people, as Jesus said, you know, it's in your heart. Right. It's in your soul. Right. It is in your soul. And that so that then puts a responsibility back on me and you and everybody watching to be who Christ has called us to be, right? Mm -hmm. To live in his mm -hmm. image, to walk in his way. And, and that then leads us back into discipleship, which is where I think the church may have, like as I think about and ponder these things, I think the church has, has uh, abdicated her responsibility for discipleship to others over the course of the last 50 years, the church in America anyway, mm -hmm. and then the export mm -hmm. of the fund. Mm -hmm. Right, we sent it to other countries so they could have as much fun as we do. <laughs> and, right, and so we we just walk in that place of understanding. This is this is on us, right? Anything that happens in the world, realistically, I think boils down, and I think that's a lot of what you've 
um, you've indicated in, in walking through this area of, of thinking about what a dystopian age would be as, as mm -hmm. everybody wants to be. Yeah, in. you know, utopia, utopia right? is uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, things that seem a bit unhinged to us today uh, are considered normal by some people. And this is because uh, they have um, abandoned the biblical narrative and the biblical worldview, not that many of them have had it, because more and more people you meet today that have no background at all in this area. And utopia is an idealism, uh, and it, the word itself means nowhere. And it was uh, what Karl Marx presented as the economic man, you know, the, the world would live and share everything. And of course, it doesn't work that way. Yes. It failed. And <laughs> tyranny is the only answer. So when you go against human nature, essentially, you end up with tyranny in order to control people's behavior. Soviet Russia, China today, uh, Cuba is an example just off our shores of what communism or Marxism does. So from going to uh, dystopia is what you end up with, of course, the classic the classic uh, novel, George Orwell, 1984, that was a dystopian culture where it was built on idealism uh, and utopianism, but it ended up being dystopian. So an awful, bleak, dark, uh, oppressive place. Hopeless. And I think that's where, you know, the love train, you know, the train with love, love wins is written on the side of the train and it left the station and there goes the culture. And here we are, as the church standing on the platform going, what happened? Yeah. We've been making disciples and saving people for 50 plus years in this culture, in my memory. And yet, look, we've, we've lost, you know, we used to have 50, 20 years ago, 50% of the population said, hey, we're Christian people. Now it's 25%. I mean, that's a big drop. And we're in decline. Why? Because We've taught this gospel that says you can become a Christian and not follow Jesus. And when you do that, then what do you expect? You're going to get a lot of people who are in agreement with doctrine, but they, the life isn't there. The power isn't there. The authenticity isn't there. Everything that is needed really to make a difference, to step into this culture and change the culture, to be the salt and the light, it hasn't been there. And this is what we're paying for right now. Yeah, hasn't been taught. And now, now we have a responsibility as the church. And so what kind of advice would you give to churches who have not uh, stepped into that place? And I think most of them would say, well, well, I don't tell people they don't have to follow Jesus. And, and what I say to that when I meet up with folks like that is, but you don't tell people they do. So you're really leaving yeah. that out. It's it's mm -hmm. omission rather than commission in that place. Right. And so yeah. what do you say to those churches mm -hmm. to um, spur them on? Some of our listeners, I'm sure, have, have friends and know folks who are in those types of churches who are willing to just sit by and let it go. Well, the, the, the way to find out what the people really believe in your church is just ask this question. Do you need to follow Jesus in discipleship to go to heaven? And they'll say, I almost guarantee you, nine out of 10 will say no. Now, what does that tell you about what has been preached? What's been preached is behavior has nothing to do with going to heaven. And what essentially I think the Bible is saying is that it's both. It's a both and, not an either or. So salvation is when God saved you, he also called you. And then all who are called to the salvation are called to discipleship, no exceptions, no excuses. To me, this is the ultimate cure. Go upstream and solve the problem that poisons the water downstream that leads to a diluted, weak, soft, lazy Christianity. And there we lay alongside the road in the dead embrace of consumer Christianity. And as long as that's the case, it's not going to get better. So, Bill, tell us just um, in in two minutes or less. We're coming to our close of our time, but 
uh, we always want to take an opportunity to let folks know what we do at the Bonhoeffer Project. So would you just give us a, a couple of minutes of why you started the Bonhoeffer Project to begin with and what it is that we do. And then I'll close up with some uh, information for them to be able to get to us. Okay, Cindy, you know, I, I started the Bonhoeffer Project uh, about seven years ago with just the idea that I wanted to get a group of leaders around a table for a year and be able to talk to them about the things that I really strongly believe in. And so uh, we, we spent the first three months of that first year wrestling with what is the gospel? The gospel we believe in determines the disciple you make. The second half of that uh, second three months, we, we wrestled with what is a disciple and how do you make them? What do they actually look like? What, what is it that we're, what's our product? You know, what are we doing here? And then the last part was make a plan a plan that you believe in that fits who you are and your gifts and your abilities and your ministry context. And so we did all that. And then uh, we did two of those groups the first year. Then we had uh, five the next year, then 14, then 25. And then it continues to grow today. We're in like 15 countries. We have representatives all over the United States. We have a faculty of north of 50 people. Uh, God's hand of favor is on it. And we, uh, it is growing and uh, I'm going to be, I'm excited to be turning over the leadership of that, not only to Cindy, but to our new CEO, uh, Dan Lights, who is also pastor of Oceanside Calvary Chapel in Oceanside, California. And we're very excited about Dan coming on board. And yesterday we had a big ceremony at his church in the three services, and it was wonderful as I pass the baton on to him. And what else did you want me to say? That'll do it. That was it, okay. That, that was good, that was good. Okay. So, so we're excited. Uh, change is good. Uh, change in our nation is good. And that's one of the things that Bill's book is about is how, how we can bring about change in our nation. Change in our churches is good because as we grow to become more like Christ, so should the churches that we attend. Uh, become more like what Christ intended the church to be. And um, as our organization grows, we there's always going to be a shifting and changing. And so I'm excited about all of that. Uh, if you want more information, um, you can email me if you just put uh, info at thebonhopperproject.com. That comes right directly to me. I'll get you some more info. We'd love to get you engaged in a cohort so that you could begin to walk through this process yourself. I will promise you that you will not uh, regret every minute that you spend in that place of just wrestling with what God has taught us as truth. And, um, where, and, and you'll see where we've gotten off track, but bring it back into that place where God transforms and, and opens the gates of heaven to pour out blessing on us. It's just been the most wonderful part of of my life uh, to date. So, and hopefully I got a long time to go, but um, we are so glad that you have joined us today. Again, you can find us at the bonhoefferproject.com. Thank you, Bill, for your time and your expertise. And we cannot wait uh, mm -hmm. to get our hands on your book. Yes, and, it's going to be exciting. Yes. Yeah. Confetti and everything. Yeah. <laughs> you want confetti? They'll make me clean that want up. Confetti. <laughs> yeah, yeah, want confetti. I could bring the confetti gun, but they will okay. make me clean okay. that. I am yeah. pretty certain. So. Thank you. Thank you. So, but uh, you guys have a great day and we will see you next time around. Thanks for joining us.